Learn inside scoop about the publishing industry from one of the leading editors and leading agents in the business on the other side of the intro. Hi everybody, I'm John Gilstrap, author of the Jonathan Grave Thriller series and beginning in February of 2021, the author of the Victoria Emerson Thriller series. And invited you in on a conversation with two of my favorite people in New York publishing, my agent, Ann Hawkins, and my editor, Michael A. Hamilton. They have both been my team leaders for, I don't know, 120 years, something like that. And we're going to talk about things, we're going to talk about the industry, kind of the, the real scoop about how the real relationship between editors and agents and, and, and all of that stuff. So before we get going, Michael, why don't you start and introduce yourself? Okay, well, I will start. My name is Michael Hamilton, and I am an executive editor at Kensington Publishing. I've been at Kensington for about 20 years, and I am just a, a born and bred bookworm in every sense. I think I'm the luckiest person in the world to live in the world of books and to have the chance to work with other people who also love books. Um, so I love fiction. I love nonfiction. Thrillers are my favorite category. Um, John and Anne and I have a lot of fun, and we've come a long ways together. So I know that I'll enjoy this conversation. Hi, everybody. I'm Anne Hawkins, and I'm a partner in John Hawkins and Associates, which by our count is the oldest literary agency in the country. Um, I represent a lot of thrillers and other crime fiction and some literary fiction. Um, and just so everyone is clear on this, I am not now, nor have I ever been, Mrs. John Hawkins. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's get down to, to brass tacks here, as it were. Um, the relationship between editors and, and, uh, and agents. We've got, you know, the editors represent the, they've got a fiscal responsibility or fiduciary responsibility to their publishers and the agents have a fiduciary responsibility to their clients. So does that put you guys at an inherently adversarial relationship? No. How can it not? I think there are, there are times where there are problems with managing or supervising the, you know, financial affairs of the client. But normally those are things like, something on a royalty statement gets messed up. And that is not the problem of the editor. That is something that's between the agency and the royalties manager. And as far as, you know, negotiating for a book, I think when you've been in the business for as long as Michael and I have been, each of us comes to the table with a pretty shrewd notion of what a fair price for the book should be. My feeling is that we're in this together and we're going to sink or swim together. And, you know, we want to make the decision that's right for the book. And chances are it's going to be right for the author and the publishing company, too. I can't think of very many examples of a decision that needs to be made where one party would benefit and the other would not. You know, we're, we're all going to share in the, in the success of whatever we do. Well, from, you know, coming from the, the author's point of view, yeah, I think all of us want to have that, that $12 million advance with the guaranteed $8 million marketing budget and all this, which, by the way, is, is not a real thing, just so you know. Um, so, so I don't know. So who, who manages those expectations? Is that on the editor or the agent saying, dude, I know I like you, but you're just not worth that much? And what, how does that work out? <laughs> I would say it's important to manage expectations from, from the beginning of a relationship. And my perspective is always very long-term. We have to play the long game. There've been too many cases where an author gets a huge advance and a huge marketing budget and the book doesn't sell. And it's very hard for that author to recoup from that position. Um, you know, it's, it's much better to build to a level of success rather than to try to start off at the top of the mountain because you know you're going to go downhill from there. I think Michael is absolutely right. And this has happened to me that, and this is back in the day when, the, you know, in the publishing industry where the grass was green and there was a unicorn in every garden and people were passing out 
half a million, quite a quarter of a million dollar advances for a first novel. And some of those people really got hurt by it because there was no way they could maintain the kind of sales that would support that sort of advance. So is it still the case? I mean, you go back to the, I'm losing, who's the Max Perkins? The, the old days of Max Perkins developing the author from nothing and making him a star and all that. Word on the street is that that just doesn't happen again. That publishers are all about bottom line, boom, you either make it or you don't, you're tossed to the curb. What do you think? I think that in today's world, we expect our authors to be professionals. We expect them to bring more to the table than their writing ability. We expect them to bring skills in drawing attention to the book, um, networking, helping to get quotes. We expect a lot more from our authors than uh, just the writing. Um, and I know that the writing is where everything starts, but editors really do not have a lot of time to spend developing a book with an author, we have to expect the author to bring it to a certain level. And I, I always think if the author can get 95% of the way, I can polish that other 5% and really make it shine like a, you know, a diamond that has been polished. But I can't help the author in the first 95% of the creative process. That's very true. And you know, from my point of view, and this I think is infringing on something else that I think you want to be discussing with us. You know, it's when I get a book, and let's say the, the person is a fabulous storyteller, and actually a pretty good wordsmith, but they have an aversion to proper punctuation and spelling, and the manuscript's riddled with typos. Well, I would never give that manuscript to Michael in that form. I would sit down and I would copy edit that thing until I got it to the 95% mark, or then I could give it to Michael. I would also say that a lot of my input to my authors is deciding what book they should write next. It's not a question of whether the author can write a good book. There are lots of good books that any given author could probably write. Um, but I have the benefit of feedback from the marketplace that most authors don't have. And I have meetings with the salespeople all the time. And I hear back about what the buyers are looking for and the chains and the other channels of distribution. And I can share that information with my authors. Um, so a lot of times it's really what book should I write next rather than the, the individual issues of a particular book. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because when Anne and I first met, um, I was three or four books into my, into my writing career. When we first met, I had this, this work of fiction that ultimately did get published. But because of where I was in my career, what she said was, no, this, this isn't, it's a fine book, but this isn't the book for now. You need, to, mm -hmm. you need something bigger to, to keep the momentum going. So that's interesting. Now, do you, I, I think by definition, agents take stuff over the transom, which means the slush pile, which is kind of an insulting name for it, I guess, but just unsolicited manuscripts that come in or queries that come in and you, and you have to evaluate them and, and decide whether or not you want to represent the author. And Michael, I believe Kensington also takes unsolicited manuscripts to a certain level. Is that, is that correct on both counts? Yes, we prefer to receive a query first. We, we would rather not receive a manuscript that we didn't ask for, but we will uh, consider queries that are sent. And a lot of times it's just a question of, well, is this the kind of book we publish? A lot of our queries are for books that, clearly the author never looked at our website. Um, you know, that's just not what we do. So, you know, children's books, illustrated books, coffee table books, we don't publish them, but you wouldn't believe how many queries I get from them. And me too. I mean, books of poetry, screenplays, you know, things I would never represent in a million years. And unfortunately, some of these inappropriate queries take your time and attention away from things that maybe you should be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing that's very important is 
you know, partly this is on the author, that the author has to say, okay, let's do some research. Let's get on uh, publisher's marketplace. Let's research what these editors and these agents actually want, you know, what they actually do and what they're good at. Because you could probably write the best romance novel in the world, and I would not recognize it. I know, Michael, uh, you've told me in the past that when you do find something you really like, one of the first things you do is tell the author that he really needs to find an agent. Is that, is that correct? Well, I asked the author if he's planning to find an agent. I, I don't really care if they do or they don't, but I just need to know at the beginning of the process because I want to know who I'm negotiating with. And at Kensington, we publish authors who do and do not have agents. So it's not like we really have a preference one way or the other. We just need to know. Which brings us to like deal points, which uh, that's, that's what I call them anyway. You know, there's more to negotiating a book deal. I, I think I'm on my 23rd at this point, something like that. So there are, there are a lot of moving parts. It's more than just advance, right? I mean, that's, everybody wants to have a, a big advance, but they also want to have sell through and they also want to have a career and all this. So, Anne, I'll start with you. When, when you're negotiating a deal, you got a new author, new to you author, and you're negotiating a deal, other than, other than just the money, what else is important to them? I think the most important thing is finding the right publishing house and the right editor for that particular book. Because not all publishing houses are created equal across all areas of fiction and nonfiction. And Michael, I see you smiling because we all know that. And, you know, if I were trying to sell John to a literary press, it's a waste of everybody's time because he writes thrillers. Not that he doesn't like beautifully, but he, he writes commercial fiction. Um, and I think it's very important that the editor and the publishing house know how to publish a specific kind of book. And I will really, I will tailor my submission list to people with reputations, or either I know them personally or they have reputations that I can trust because there is no worse thing than hooking up an author with the wrong editor. And Michael, is that something you can tell before it's too late, if you've been hooked up with the wrong author? I mean, you kind of have to be hip deep into the project before you realize, uh oh. Uh, usually there are indications very early in the process. <laughs> <laughs> and I usually try to shield you from the wrong ones. So what are the deal breakers? You know, what is the, if, for, if, if, for authors who are, who are either getting their first agent or shifting agents or shifting publishers, there are good relationships and, and there are bad relationships and it, and it works both ways, right? But I, I happen to know, I, I, I don't want to put you on, I do want to put you on the spot, but yeah, obviously don't name names. What are the, what are the characteristics of the clients or the authors from hell? Well, first of all, they don't deliver their manuscripts on time. <laughs> I was a couple of weeks late, okay? <laughs> what? Just a couple about of you, weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I think unrealistic expectations on the part of the author are the root of many evils. I mean, if they say, well, you know, my book obviously deserves to be published in hardcover with a six-figure advance, and I expect, you know, a full page in the New York Times book review, you know, sorry, that's not going to happen. Uh, the other thing that I think makes for a client from hell is, and the, again, part of this responsibility is on me, is someone who knows nothing about the publishing industry and has no interest in learning. Because again, this goes back to expectations. They feel that you can pull rabbits out of hats. And if they knew how the process works, they would know better than that. Um, I would say one of one of my pet peeves really is the author who can't make up their mind. And so, um, you know how they say on the quiz shows, is this your final answer? I don't want to have to pull it out of the author. Do you like the cover or do you not like the cover? Do you like the cover copy? Give me one answer, let me run with it, and then I need to move on to my next deadline. Um, it's the authors who send me 
three or four or more emails to answer one question. That's very hard to deal with. You know, one of the things that is a real bugaboo of mine, <clears throat> especially when I'm, I, you know, I, I speak a lot of conferences and, and, and that sort of thing. People who don't understand that this is a business, you know, that if, if you're trying to sell your book, even if it's not going to be your career, it is the career of the people who are buying your book. So, you know, if you're going to open a 7-Eleven or if you're going to open a consulting firm or whatever, you're going to study the marketplace to know how your business works. And these folks who just crank out words and then expect everybody else to do the business elements and not understand, it makes me crazy. I think it's true that many authors should do a lot more homework about their industry. And there are so many resources that can teach them, and most of them are available on Google. But you can subscribe to newsletters and Publishers Weekly and you can get a sense of the industry. Many industry veterans have written books about the whole process. Um, I, I think that a lot of authors would benefit from understanding the industry better. What do you say to those who maintain, and you hear it all the time, of course, self-publishing is a big thing now. And there's nothing wrong with self-publishing. I'm not casting aspersions on self-publishing. But a lot of people get into that because the word on the street is, it's the traditional publishing is closed down. It's, it's a, it's a insider network. You have to know somebody to make it happen. And what are your thoughts? This is not true. I'm in my office. We take on new people all the time and we're successful with most of them. Granted, we try to pick people that we have a very good idea of where to sell them. And we also pick books that are within our areas of expertise so that, you know, if I find a book that is terrific, but there I have a eureka moment and it's like, whoa, this book is 50 pages too long, but you know, you could end it 50 pages earlier. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can make those kind of suggestions. And the problem with self-publishing is it is rare for a self-published book to be edited. And many first time authors are not capable of doing a really good job of self editing. I mean, you look at the people who've been very successful in self publishing, most of them have been authors who were previously traditionally published and have been through the editorial process and they know this stuff. So I think it's, no, we, but our standards are pretty high. I would say that uh, publishers need new authors. We constantly are looking for um, that special breakout first novel. You know, a lot of the um, media that we deal with in getting attention for books is very receptive to new authors. And they, they're looking to spotlight new authors. We have to have new authors for them. Uh, I think there's something about the word new that's ingrained in the American psyche that we're, we always want the new season of television, new this, new that. Um, so we, yes, we do need new authors and we have to make sure that we pick the ones who are the right fit for us at Kensington because we have certain skills and certain experience that we can draw on to help a new author um, achieve some degree of, of recognition, but it has to be the right author and the right book. A, a lot of things have to come into alignment, but in every season that we publish, there is a percentage of new authors. So that the fact that someone has not been published before would not be held against them if it's the right book for us at the right time. You, know, you said something earlier that I could, I could hear the audience gasping when, when you said it, that you, these days you expect authors to do more than just write. You expect them to essentially, I'm paraphrasing badly here, but essentially go out and, and beat their own drum, which brings up the whole concept of author platform, um, he, which I presume is, is having platform and networking in my mind are pretty much the same thing. You, you have a, a basis of folks who are not guaranteed to buy your books, but at least primed to, to think about it. The word on the street when you go to Facebook boards and all of that is if you don't, if you're a new writer, 
you've got to build your platform before you can sell your first book. Uh, how important is the whole platform thing and what does it mean to you? A platform is very different for fiction and nonfiction writers. In, in nonfiction, we're definitely looking for an author who already has some degree of an audience, somebody who is recognized as an expert on a certain field or has had a certain unique experience that they want to share with the world. Um, that, that's a different kind of platform for fiction writers. Um, we just want to know what they've got. If they don't have a platform, we can help them with it. We expect them to have some degree of uh, facility in using social media. Some authors will already have a website before they come to us. Some will not. Some are just at the beginning of their careers. And um, if they're writing in a category such as cozy mysteries or Amish romances, we want them to know what their category is all about. We want them to be aware of, of what matters to the readers of their category. We want them to be aware of where those readers hang out, whether it's a, a forum online or a, a blog or a podcast. Um, we, we need to sense that the author has some way of reaching the audience, has, has just some, some awareness of where that audience is and how we can work together to reach the audience. So in fiction, yes, it's, it's definitely a building process. Um, if you don't have quotes on your previous book to put on your website, you're not going to have a review page on your website. But you can still have a blog page and um, a, a bio page and a gallery page with photos and you can have tips and recipes. You can still have a website even if you haven't been published before. So we're just looking for authors who are creative in, in their outlook and their approach to finding the audience. And is this for those who say, you know, that's not my, not my job. For those who say, that's just not what I do. I don't want to do that. I just want to write books. What do you say? I say, have a nice life. <laughs> <laughs> so these days it, it is part of the job and there is an expectation that a writer will have some presence on social media i mean they don't they don't have to live their lives on social media but they at least have to have a web page you know most likely they are on facebook maybe twitter and instagram i mean these are just the normal things that authors do it I want to make one point that is, you know, we've been accenting the positive is what authors, authors can do to promote their work. Social media works in both, both directions. And if an author has something out there on social media that causes the agent or the editor or the publisher to gasp, uh, that is not going to do them a bit of good. Mm -hmm. And it could ruin their chances. That's so true, Anne. So how important then within this context, when, when life returns to normal, we're recording this during the, the days of COVID, when life returns to normal and conferences and such happen again, how important are, are those for an author's career? I would say I always recommend attending conferences, but it's not mandatory. But there has to be some indication that the author can network and get to know other authors and belong to organizations that are devoted to their type of book. Um, you, you, you do need to have friends in, in this world. And um, it's, it's not always possible for authors to attend conferences, but it definitely helps. I agree with things for an author going to a conference is number one, Conferences, it's not just about networking, it's about learning something. And if you go to something like Thriller Fest or VoucherCon, and you go to the panels with some real pros on it, you can learn a whole lot. Uh, as far as finding an agent, um, I am not a fan of the speed dating type of um, pitch sessions. I just find that they are so wearing and after a certain amount of time, somebody will be walking away from your desk and you'll say, 
what did they just say that book was about? So I think they're, <laughs> as far as getting an agent, you know what I'm talking about, Michael. I mean, oh, it, is, it really, it is, it is burnout, complete burnout. But I always tell folks, if you're going to go to a, a, a conference, the panels are great. All of that is great. That all business is conducted in the bar. You know, that's where you're going to meet other writers. That's where you're going to meet. Um, you know, you're going to just chat about people and make friendships. And this is, do you agree, this is fundamentally an industry of relationships? I, I heartily agree. I, I think it's all about relationships. And that's why it's so important to keep your eye on the long run. Because you can't close doors. You have to be able to go to the right person at the right time when something comes up. So, uh, yeah, it is definitely about relationships. And for me, when I started my career in publishing, I was so excited about working with books that I really had no idea about all the fantastic people I was going to be working with. And in addition to the editorial skills I developed over the years, the skills of managing relationships have also been crucial. I agree with Michael. This is an industry where, I mean, we are so blessed because we're working with smart people day in and day out. You know, the, the authors, the editors, our colleagues, it is just a wonderful thing to be dealing with people who are, you know, mentally active and acute and wanting to learn things. Um, so, I mean, I think that's one of the huge, and as far as the relationships go, I mean, I was talking with one of my authors who decided that she wanted to try a different publishing house. I said, well, are there any editors that you happen to have met at conferences? And she said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I did meet so-and-so, but I think she was probably too drunk to remember me. <laughs> Well, listen, folks, this has been a lot of fun. I, 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 I hope people who watch this are going to get a lot out of it. I know that I've had, I haven't seen you guys in forever, it seems. So, you know, if, if for nothing I else, you. I'm there. Well, there you have it. Some audio glitches and all. Please subscribe to my channel. Please take care of yourselves. And please keep reading. I'm John Gilstrap. <laughs>